Week number two of At The Movies. Today we're going to be looking at one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I think he's one of my favorite because I feel like um, I'm a lot like him. And uh, we, we, I think some of the mistakes, some of the things that he does are a lot of the things that when I look through different characters in Scripture, um, he's one of those that I'm like, yeah, I could see myself doing that. Yeah, I could see myself acting like that. I could see myself responding like that. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I love when I get an opportunity to preach about Peter. And here's what I want to do. I, I want to fast forward. We're going to look at when Jesus called Peter. But what I want to do is I want to fast forward to Acts. And Jesus has already gone to the cross. Jesus has already risen from the dead. Pentecost has already come. And now we find Peter and John. Peter and John have been arrested because they are preaching in the name of Jesus. A massive movement for Jesus is taking place. People are beginning to be concerned. They're wondering how in the world are we going to combat this? What are we going to do? We thought when we took care of Jesus, this was taken care of. And now all of a sudden there is a massive uprising that's taken place. In one setting when Peter preached, 3,000 people gave their heart and their life to Jesus. God is doing great things in this moment. And here, the, the leaders are gathered together talking. And listen to what they say about Peter and John. Verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished because they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I think in, in, in all the Bible, this is probably my favorite scripture. Because it didn't say, because of who they were, because of their background, because of their parents, because of where they were raised, because of what they were afforded and how they grew up, it just says that these were men who they didn't go to school and get trained the ordinary way. And then on top of that, they were just normal people. But there was something different about these guys. There was something different about these men. And here's what it said, and here's what I pray everybody when you walk through the doors of the church, I pray with all my heart that when you leave, your, your response is this, Pastor Johnny is the exact same as Peter and John. He's been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. They, I don't know what else to say. There, there's no other way to describe it. There's nothing else we can say. All we can say is this. He's been with Jesus. My prayer for our church when we leave these doors and when we go out into the street, my prayer is this, is that people recognize and see that this church has been with Jesus. Walking through the doors is not enough. Sitting in the seats is not enough. Raising your hands and singing is not enough. We need a touch from Jesus and we need those moments where when people look at us, they say, they've been with Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to bring change. That's the only thing that's going to bring revival. That's the only thing that's going to spark change in your family, spark change in your home, spark change in a community. It's the fact that people look and they say there's something different. There's something, I don't know what it is. He stumbles over his words when he reads scripture sometimes. He gets confused. You can tell he's not highly educated. He didn't go to Harvard. Harvard. Or Yali. He didn't yell. He didn't, he, he's from Sapalupa. There's nothing special. But here's the thing. He's been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. And look at Peter and John's response towards the end. They stand up and they say, we've got to do something. We've got to keep them quiet. 
And Peter and John's response is this. How can we? How can we stay silent? And it says this in verse 20. We cannot help but speak about all that we have seen and heard. When you've been with Jesus, you can't stay silent. When you've been with Jesus, you can't help but tell people about it. When you've been with Jesus, you walk out of these doors and it's one of those things. I can't help but shout it from the rooftops because I've been with Jesus. And there's everything inside of me that says, I can't keep quiet because I've seen, I've heard, I've watched what Jesus can do. I've experienced it. I've watched it with my own eyes. I've felt it with my own heart. I can't keep quiet. You've got to meet this Jesus that I met. And so today, how does Peter get to this point? To where these men look and they say, he's ordinary, he's common, but there's something different. He's been with Jesus. And then Peter stands up and Peter says this, I can't keep quiet because I've been with Jesus. Today, we're going to look at the encounter where Peter met Jesus. And so today, week two of At The Movies. bark sometimes too. Cast after cast. And I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the heavens. And then what? Huh? Make the chosen as many as the stars. Only to let Egypt enslave us for generations. Bring us out of Egypt. Part the Red Sea. Only to let us wander in the desert for 40 years. Give us the land. Only to let us be exiled in Babylon. Bring us back. Only to be crushed by Rome. This is the God 
I've served so faithfully my entire life. You're the God I'm supposed to thank. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you enjoy yanking us around like goats and can't decide whether we're chosen or not. Which one is it? Ah! Diamond. Andrew? Who are you talking to? Apparently no one. You shouldn't joke like that, my friend. Yeah, your friends might think you've lost faith. James and John, I presume. And who brought the old man? I heard you need a real fisherman. How'd you know I was here? Eden may be angry, but she's not too proud to ask for help. Ah, so you told her the whole story, huh? Yeesh. How'd she take it? Let's just say it's my last night as a free man and I'm fishing. Your last night? Quintus. Well, uh, there are only so many hours in the night, huh? Let's fish. nothing. In the morning, maybe you could hide in the merchant caravans, escape to Egypt. Fish the Nile. You got perch the size of children. Egypt is a Roman province now. Nah, Eden hates Egypt. So? She can wait for you to send money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping if I let Quintus and his boys take out their frustrations on me, He'll eventually allow me visitors. Head down. So, about the news I was to tell you about. I was walking with John, they called about Tyson. Andrew. What's he on about? And he pointed at him. No more. And he said, behold, the lamb. Andrew, I said, Please, not another word from you about this lamb of yours. We don't need a lamb, we need fish. As we catch up with Peter, Peter finds himself with his back against the wall. Peter finds himself owing a lot of taxes. Peter finds himself trying to provide for his family. Because of the money that he owes in taxes, he's fixing to be arrested. So he goes out his last night of freedom, trying to catch fish, trying to provide for his family, trying to pay the taxes that he owes. But it doesn't work. He catches nothing. He comes up empty. Nothing changes. He works hard. He throws those nets. He's sweating. He works all night long and nothing changes. See, this problem wasn't just something that just came up out of nowhere. It, this has been a problem for a while. He hasn't been catching fish. He, he hasn't been able to provide for his family. He hasn't been able to keep up with his taxes and he finds himself in a problem. This is something that's been going on for a while. See, the question that you need to answer for yourself is this. How do you respond when things don't go your way? How do you respond when you're not catching the fish? How do you respond when your back's up against the wall? See, here's the thing. Peter was a good person. Peter was a hard worker. But Peter couldn't seem to catch a break. 
Sound familiar? Maybe for some of you, you're a hard worker. Maybe for some of you, you feel like you're a good person and you still just can't catch a break. And so what do you do when you've done all that you can do and still nothing changes? What do you do when you find yourself in those hopeless situations? Those situations where there's no place to turn and nothing else that you can do. Well, Peter, we see in other scenes that we aren't watching today, Peter decided to turn his back on some friends. He decided to turn his back on other fishermen. He decided to take the side of the Romans and he decided to turn his friends in. He decided to turn fishermen in. See, here, here's what you have to understand. Character is revealed not when things are going great, but when things are hard. See, your character is revealed not when everything is wonderful. Your character is revealed when pressure hits. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this, but the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel standing in front of all of David's brothers, they look incredible. And he says this, God says this to Samuel as he's fixing to choose the next king. He says this, do not look on their outward appearance. They look the part. They seem like everything is together. They seem like they would be perfect for king. But God says this to Samuel, don't look at their outward appearance or on their height or on their stature. He says, because this, because I have rejected them. And then he says this, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks deeper. God looks into the heart. See, God's looking at character. What do you do when the pressure begins to mount? Have you ever thought to yourself that by now you thought things would be different? Have you ever thought that by this time when you were a young kid, you were dreaming and you just knew that by this age, by this time, things would be different. But yet you find yourself in a situation where you're still struggling to make payments. You still find yourself behind on bills. You find yourself struggling to put food on the table for your family. And you find yourself fighting every single day just to survive. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The question then becomes, does God still have a plan for your life even when that plan doesn't look like what you have dreamed of? Does God still have a plan for you even when the net comes up empty? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. The question becomes, are you going to trust God? Or are you going to look at the situation and lean on what you see in front of you? Are you going to trust God? Or are you going to look and you're going to see the nets are empty? What are we going to do? I'm leaning on what is in front of me. I'm leaning on what I see. Because here's the thing, even when things don't look the way that you want, here's my encouragement to you today. Trust God. time for this, Andrew. It's him! Simon! It's the man! John said he's here! Right now! May I ask a favor? I'm teaching these people and apparently they're having trouble hearing me. If I could stand on your boat, that would be helpful. They're having trouble hearing you, huh? Yes, yes, of course. Please, please, stand on our boat. Thank you. 
I need to go. I'm sorry. No time for this today. Stay a few moments longer. I have something for you. For me? Uh, I'm in a hurry. Yes, I know. Just allow me a few moments. Please. Sam, trust me as I have trusted you. This man is the Messiah. It's good to see you again, Andrew. Yes. I'm Jesus. Thanks for this. Simon. In my last moments with you, I want to share another story. Can everyone hear me? Well, let's thank our friends for this strong boat, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Trust me, my yelling voice is not easy on the ears. Because I'm on this boat, my final parable should be about fishing, yes? Simon, please send me that net. When this net is thrown into the sea, what happened, Simon? Well... I mean most of the time. It gathers. A, a little louder. It gathers fish. Yes. This net gathers fish. All kinds of fish, yes? Yes. All kinds of fish. And the kingdom of heaven is like what happens next. After the net is full, Simon and the others draw it to the shore, sit down, and sort out the fish. The good fish go into the barrels, and the bad fish thrown away. So it will be at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. Do you understand? Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, like you all are now, is like the master of a house who brings forth his treasures, both new and old. You are to do the same with this knowledge. These parables I tell make sense to some, not to others. Be patient. That is all for today. I have some business to attend to with my new friend. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. At your word.
I told you. I told you. I told you. The boat, it's still out! Get out! Get out. <laughs> My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, I'm sorry. Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. I will. Rabbi. You as well. Yes, you, James and John. Come, follow me. Take the fish into market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. So, you sure you don't want to do this just a few more times? Oh, we'll make a great team on the boat. Son, joking. <laughs> Fish are nothing. You have much bigger things ahead of you, Simon, son of Jonah. Did you understand that parable I told earlier? From now on, I will make you fishers of men. And you are to gather as many as possible, all kinds. I will sort them out later. Peter's frustrated. Peter spent all night fishing and Peter caught nothing. He worked hard. He did everything he could and he came up empty. Now he finds himself bringing his boat to the edge of the shore to clean his nets, to prepare the boat for another day of fishing later on. And as he's pulling up, Jesus is standing on the shore teaching to people. Jesus approaches Peter and asks him, Peter, can I stand in your boat and teach these people so that they can hear me better? After Jesus gets done teaching the people, Jesus asks Peter to do something. Peter, will you throw your nets in the water? Peter's the one who is a professional fisherman. Peter's the one who's been out all night long. Peter's the one that knows nothing is biting and so my question for you is this, how many times are we disobedient to God because we think we know better than God? How many times have we missed opportunities that God is directing us in and leading us in because we feel like we have more insight than God? But it's interesting Peter's response in this moment. Remember, Peter's the one who's the professional here, but Peter responds in this way. At your word, I will do it. God, because you said so, I'm going to do it. God, it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to do it. God, I don't understand why you're asking me to do this, but I'm going to do it. Here's what I want to encourage you with today. Sometimes what God asks you to do will not make sense. 
but not doing it is disobedience. See, you don't need everything to make sense in order to be obedient to what God is calling you to do. You just need to have the same response that Peter has. God, because you said it, I will do it. God, because you have asked me, I'm going to do it. God, I'm the fisherman. I've been out, but yes, Lord, I will do it. Because some, sometimes God works in ways that we don't understand. And so what ends up happening is Peter has the greatest catch of his life. Peter pulls the fish in. It's actually so many fish, he can't get it on his own. He has to holler to his friends to come over and help him. They pull the fish in. Peter steps out of the boat and Peter's response is he falls on his knees and he looks at Jesus and says, I am unworthy. How many times do we walk through the doors of the church with an arrogant attitude? With an attitude of God, just be happy that I'm here. God, just be satisfied that I came through the doors of the church. God, just be satisfied that I'm sitting here. When really what the Bible is teaching us, our response to God should be the same response that Peter gave in this moment. We fall to our knees and we say, God, we're unworthy. Unworthy of who you are, unworthy of what you've done for us, unworthy of your love and your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace in our life. God, we are unworthy. And we fall to our knees and we worship you. See, Peter tells Jesus, I I'm unworthy, Jesus. Jesus, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the past that I've lived. But Peter says this, anything you ask, I'll do it. And Jesus responds with this. In Matthew 4, 19 and 20, Jesus says, follow me. And he says, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then here's the interesting thing in verse 20. It says, at once, Peter left his nets and he followed Jesus. All that catch, everything that was right there, what Peter had dreamed of, providing for his family, paying off the debt that he owes, everything was covered right there, but Peter responds with leaving everything to follow Jesus. My question for you today is this, what is keeping you from following Jesus? What is it that you're still holding on to? What is it that you're unwilling to let go? What is it that you are unwilling to leave behind? What is it that holds more value to you than a relationship and following Jesus at all cost? Because according to the world, Peter had done great things in that moment. But Peter looked at all the stuff that had just happened, everything that had just taken place. And he says, this is worthless compared to following Jesus. What is it in your life that you are holding on to, that you are unwilling to let go in order to follow Jesus? I want to encourage you today. Follow Jesus. Eden, we need to talk. So I hear. What have you heard? Nothing that makes sense. <sighs> Last night you told me the truth. Let's continue with that. So, I worked for hours last night, and I couldn't even catch one fish the entire night. And then Andrew and the boys showed up. Thank you for that, by the way. And none of us could catch one fish the entire night. It was horrible. 
And this morning we finally gave up and we went to shore, but there was this teacher on shore. And Andrew knew who he was, but I'll talk about that later. He told me to cast one more time, which made no sense, but I did it anyway because of the way he, he looked at me. And then so many fish showed up. They were pouring into the boat. So many kept coming that, that Zebedee ended up filling both of our boats, enough to pay off the whole debt. I... Eh... What? I know. Why don't you seem happy? Well, this is hard to explain. More than what you just told me. You no, know, it's like the story of Elijah and Elisha. Yes? Elisha was plying with 12 yoke of oxen when Elijah the prophet just walked up and threw his cloak over him. I, I call him to follow him. And without delay, Elisha slaughtered the oxen, burned the plow and left everything behind. Yes. The, the teacher, Andrew told me, but I didn't believe him at first. He's the Messiah. I know it sounds impossible, but I... I saw it with my own eyes. He made boatfuls of fish appear out of nowhere. And the words he spoke, the one John told Andrew was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was him. And then, and then he called me to follow him. And Andrew, James, and John to go where he goes and, and to learn from him. And he said that I wouldn't be a fisherman anymore, but that I would catch people instead. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. But I'm sure what I saw. He's the one we've been waiting for all our lives. And I want to quit fishing and leave the sea behind to go. I know, I know, I know it makes no sense, and I knew it would make you upset. All I can tell you is that this I'm not is. Upset. <sighs> oh, why would I be upset? Come here. Come here. Come here. This is the man. Couldn't make this up. <laughs> of course, he chose you. I don't know why he did. I tried to tell him I'm a sinful man. Everyone is sinful. I don't know what this means. I don't know yet how I'm going to provide. I don't care about that. Then why are you crying? Because someone finally sees. What I have always seen. You're more than a fisherman. You know, I, I will travel sometimes. I don't want you to feel abandoned. You have to go with him. How could I feel abandoned? I feel saved. Eden, yeah. yeah, it's not gonna be easy. When have we ever had anything easy? not our people's way. <laughs> hey, there's a couple things I, I want to just finish with today. And, and the first one is, is this. Peter, as he's approaching his wife to tell her what Jesus has done in his wife, he's nervous because he's afraid of her response. And her response is, this is the moment that I've been praying for and waiting for. For some of you, you walk through the doors, but you walk through the doors alone. For some of you, you walk through the doors, but your kids don't come with you. For some of you, you come through the doors, but your friends don't come with you. Your parents don't come with you. And I want you to understand today, listen, your prayers are not in vain. Peter's wife looks at him and says, this is what I've been praying for. For some of you, you're sitting here today because your wife has been praying for you. Because your husband has been praying for you. Because your parents have been praying for you. Because your kids, they've been praying for you. Because friends, 
They've been praying for you. And here's what I want to encourage you with today. Maybe today that person is not with you, but I want you to understand this. Don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop inviting. Don't stop encouraging. Don't stop telling them about Jesus. Silence changes nothing. Jesus is the only thing that's going to change them. Sitting in silence and saying nothing is not going to change them. Encouraging them and reminding them who Jesus is and how much he loves them. That's what's going to change them. And his wife looks at him and says, this is the moment that I've been praying for. But she also said this. She said, finally, somebody has seen in you what I've always seen in you. Maybe today what you don't realize is you don't realize the potential that is inside of you. See, I think Peter's wife saw in Peter what took place in Acts while Peter was standing on a boat. I think she saw something greater inside of Peter that he didn't even see inside of himself because he was so consumed with the moment But in Acts, what does it say? These ordinary men. His wife looks at him and says, I don't see ordinary. I see extraordinary. I see so much more. I see so much greater. See, everybody else just looks at you and they use this word ordinary. But when God looks at you, when God sees you, He sees potential, he sees purpose, he sees calling, he sees something different. And his wife looks at him and says, I see that in you. And I'm just glad finally somebody else saw it in you too. Maybe today the words that you need to hear is this, we see in you what God sees in you. We see the potential that God sees in you. We see what God can do through you. If you will just be who Peter was, an ordinary man that spent time with Jesus. Nothing substitute time with Jesus. There's nothing better. You can chase everything you want. You can go after everything you want. But time with Jesus changes everything. It takes ordinary people and turns them into extraordinary people. If you want to do something extraordinary, here's the thing. You've got to spend time with Jesus. There's no other substitute. There's no other way around it. But here's the thing. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep pressing on. Because God sees in you Maybe what you don't even see in yourself. And so today, uh, as we finish up week two, I want to pray with you. So we bow your head and close your eyes. Listen, here's the first thing that you have to do. When you walk through these doors of the church every single week, there is an opportunity for, for you to give your heart and your life to Jesus. For you to trust in him. To allow yourself to be forgiven of what you didn't think you were worthy of being forgiven of. See, that's what Peter said when he came out of the boat. He said, get away from me. Depart from me, Lord. I'm unworthy. I'm a sinful man. Maybe today you walk through the doors and you realize you are a sinful person, but you need a savior. You need Jesus. And today you need to repent of your sins and you need to turn to Jesus. And if you have never done that, the Bible says this, today is the day of your salvation. And so maybe today you give your heart and your life to Jesus. Maybe today you turn from your sins and you follow Jesus. Is there anybody in the room today who would say, I need Jesus? Would you just lift your hand? If there's anybody watching online today, listen, there's a number in the seat. I want you to text that number. There's a number on the screen. I mean, I want you to text that number. Thank you. Who else? Raise your hand. Who else? It says, I need Jesus today. Just lift your hand. 
Here's what I want us to do. Church, will you pray a prayer out loud with those that have their hands raised today saying, I need Jesus. I'm unworthy. But God forgives me. So right now, wherever you are, pray this prayer out loud with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to the earth, died on the cross, and rose from the grave. God, forgive me of my sins. I repent. I turn to you. Be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you celebrate those who made a decision today to follow Jesus?